Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Joseph's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat weirdly beside the well. It was about noontime. Soon the Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please, Give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised for Jesus refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? And Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I will give you living water. But sir, you don't know have a rope or a water jar, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And the site, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob? Who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than that he's giving to his children and his animals enjoy? And Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who have the water I will give will be never thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. And Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband you have had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, I perceive that you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it as her at Mount Gerizim? where our ancestors worshipped. And Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will be no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritan knows little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him. For salvation comes through the Jews, but the time is coming indeed it is here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way, for God is spirit. So those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am 
the Messiah. Just then, his disciples came back. They were shocked to find them talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerves to ask. What do you want from her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his messages and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we heard it ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was fully human 
and he embraced the suffering that human life brings. He was thirsty. They tried to give him something to drink by taking a sponge dipped in water and putting on a reed and holding it up to him. But was this the kind of thirst that Jesus was talking about? I thirst. Many months before this event, this terrible, tragic event of his crucifixion, Jesus was on a journey. We are all on a journey. Lent reminds us that life itself is a journey, and we know not when the next turn will come. It is so unpredictable uh, how our lives will go as they begin to unfold. We know times of great joy, and we know times of great sorrow, such as the journey of life. And on this particular occasion, Jesus was journeying through a foreign country. He and his disciples were traveling the shortcut through Samaria on their way to the holy city of Jerusalem. It was enemy territory. It'd be similar to if you were an Israeli walking through at the, uh, at, at the late hours through the West Bank. Uh, Palestinian territory. There was no great love that existed between the Samaritans and the Jews as there is no great love that exists between Palestinian and Israeli. They took a great risk to take this route through this foreign country. <clears throat> we are told that on this occasion they were passing by a village of Samaria called Sakar. And there the disciples went ahead into the village to seek provisions, to buy some groceries, and Jesus, who was weary from the journey, stayed behind outside of the village of Sakar at the ancestral well that was uh, dug by their ancestor, Jacob. Jacob was not only the ancestor of the people of the Jews, he was also the ancestor of the Samaritans because this was a family division. And there's no uh, bitterness and separation worse than when a family is divided, when people who share the same tradition and the same heritage see themselves as bitter enemies. And so Jesus sat by the well, the ancient well of Jacob. And we are told by the gospel writer, it was about the noon hour in the heat of the day, in the brightness of the Middle Eastern sun that blazed down upon him. And as Jesus was sitting there at the well, he noticed a single solitary figure approaching the well from the village of Sakar, and it was a woman, and she was by herself and alone, and no doubt that woman was able to see Jesus sitting there, and she probably was nervous and afraid, because this was a stranger, not someone that she would have recognized from the village. <coughs> not only that, but he was a foreigner, and he was a Jew, <coughs> despised by all Samaritans. And as he approaches the well and pretends to ignore him as she lowers her jar into the waters of the well to gain water for her home, for her household needs, Jesus does the unthinkable. It doesn't seem unthinkable to us, but in that day and time and in that uh, context, it was a daring, risky, audacious thing for Jesus to do. He spoke to the woman. A good Jewish man in fact, a good Samaritan man would never address a woman in public, let alone someone of a different ethnic group. And he asks her for a drink of water. Yes, Jesus was weary. Jesus knew what it was like to feel thirst, and he was thirsty, and he wanted fresh water to drink. And so he makes this simple request to this woman. She is shocked. She is astonished. And she immediately says, how is it that you, a Jew, would ask me, a Samaritan, for a drink of water? How is it you, that you would break down the taboos and the barriers that have been erected carefully to bring order to our social life? Why would you even speak as a man to me, a woman? And then Jesus responds by saying these enigmatic words. Oh, if you only knew the gift... And the one who was speaking to you, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So we now have an exchange, a holy conversation. If today you hear his voice, 
Harden not your heart. The woman heard his voice. And as they are engaged in this conversation uh, with one another, I would like for you to observe something else that is wrong with this picture. The woman is coming out in the middle of the day alone. This is counter to the customs of the time because usually it was the woman's work to collect water at the well. Just like today, it's the man's job to take garbage out to the curb. <laughs> a woman goes and fetch water. Men never do that. And this became a great opportunity uh, for women to socialize, the women of the village, because they would gather in the coolness of the early morning in the city square, and they would gather together with all their water jars, ready to go to get water for their families for the day because there was no indoor plumbing in Sakaar. And as they were gathered there, this was an opportunity. They did this every day except for Sabbath day. And there would be an opportunity for them to share news of what's going on in the family, what their children are doing. It's a great opportunity. Women do this. They get together and they talk about their husbands. This is something they were probably doing. This is something they look forward to. It was a time of camaraderie and friendship and, 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 and bonding with one another as the women of the village. But this woman wasn't a part of that crowd. She didn't go early in the morning. She went in the heat of the day, in part to guarantee that there would be no one else there. So this woman was quite surprised that there would be this stranger sitting there to disrupt her solitude. We will learn as the conversation unfolds just why this woman was coming out at this strange hour of the day all by herself. We learn in the conversation that this woman was an outcast. She was someone who was supremely marginalized by this community because as she has the conversation with Jesus and she learns about the gift of living water, Jesus tells her, go call your husband. And the woman says to him, I have no husband. A simple, direct answer, period, end of story. Do not ask me any more questions. And Jesus says to the woman who gave him that short, evasive answer, you are speaking the truth because, as a matter of fact, you have had five husbands. And the man you're living with is not even your husband. Yes, you have spoken truthfully. My brothers and sisters, there is no sense whatsoever in trying to hide anything from God. You can't lie to God. You can't hide the failures of your life. And so Jesus now confronts her with the truth about herself. She now sees the truth about herself and Jesus says to her, you have spoken the truth. Many of us are afraid to face the truth about ourselves. But Jesus calls this woman, and she knew that he was speaking the truth, and he affirmed that she too was speaking the truth. That's what we mean by confession. Confession is not beating yourself up. Confession is just acknowledging the truth about yourself because when you can see the truth about yourself, then you can see the truth about God. And notice one thing in this conversation that Jesus had. Not once did he say to her anything that would be condemning of her. Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, it is written. And he nor would he condemn this marginalized woman. He didn't take her aside and says, you know, I can help you out with your problems. You can go get an annulment for your first marriage, and perhaps for the second, the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and then you'll be right with the church. <laughs> no, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus got right to the point of why he came into the world. I am giving you living water. It's not about how you have failed. We have all failed, because that's the truth about our human state. But it's according to God's great love and grace that he offers her the Holy Spirit. Because the living water that Jesus is talking about is the Holy Spirit. My brothers and sisters, yes, we are creatures that are hungry. We are creatures that thirst. 
There is a deep yearning within the depths of our heart, and I'm not talking about food and drink in the normal way. I'm talking about that which truly makes us human. We are hungry. We are thirsting. We have a deep hidden desire in the depths of our heart for something that only God can fulfill, only God can satiate. And yet we wander around thinking that in wealth, or in power, or in fame, or in some other acquisition, that we will be satisfied. And I'm reminded of that song by that rocker, Mick Jagger, who says, I get no satisfaction. <laughs> and then another uh, rock and roll group from the 80s, U2, and I remember that song on the album Joshua by U2, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Isn't this the prayer of every human heart? We are never satisfied, for the things of this world will never fully satiate us. We will drink of the water of the world and we will thirst again. And Jesus is talking about another kind of water altogether, another kind of libation. Where once we drink from it, then it issues forth in fountains of living water, life, spiritual life that emerges from the depths of our hearts. That is what we really want. We are hungry for the presence of God in our lives. That is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's St. Paul that tells us that while we were yet enemies of God, God sent his own son to die for us. And if we put our trust in him, if we put our trust in the love of God, if we invest that trust in God, we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of love will be poured out in all of our hearts. This is the living water that Jesus was offering this lonely, solitary woman, solitary woman there at the well of Samaria. We know of her thirst. We are deeply acquainted with that deep hunger. There is an ache in all of our hearts, and yet at the same time, there is one who loves us so much, who is present in the person of Jesus, who speaks to our hearts and says, I will satisfy your thirst. I will satiate your hunger. I will bring you what your heart has always desired, that living water of the Holy Spirit. And then the woman responded. She said, you know, Messiah is to come, and we are told that he will teach us all things. And then Jesus simply responds to this woman, and this is the moment of epiphany, of revelation for her. I am he, the one who is speaking to you. I am he. I am the giver of the Holy Spirit. I am the giver of the water of life. Ask of me, and I will give it to you freely. This is the one who, months later, will hang on a cross and cry out in a plaintive way, I thirst. This is the one who today speaks to our hearts. If today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. That's the gospel of the Lord. Amen.